Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you, viewers. Welcome to your questions. This is your host, Ibrahim K. Asante. With me to answer your questions today is Ustaz Abdallah Diba Saab, who is a qualified missionary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in the UK. We would like to thank you once again for sending in your questions from the previous program. You are more than welcome to keep sending more questions to the numbers on your screen. Without delaying any further, shall we please go on to the first question? And the first question, Ustaz Diba, is from Sule. Sule wants to know, what shows that Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him, was the true Messiah? What are the signs? Was he the true Messiah or is he the true Messiah? Um, to determine if someone is uh, from God or not, because as the Messiah, the Mahdi has to be sent by God according to the prophecies that we find in the sayings of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. And um, of course, if anyone claims, then they have to fulfill you know, those signs that have been mentioned. The things that the Holy Prophet وسلم, told Muslims would be at that time to look out for when someone claims to be this person, this holy person that will come to revive faith in the name of the Messiah and the Mahdi. And um, for, for any individual that claims some signs need to, look, need to be looked at. But when you look at the Holy Quran, God Almighty has made it clear that he only reveals manifold of his um, signs to people that he has chosen among, from his uh, messengers. So he only shows manifold of his signs to those people that he has chosen, mm -hmm. that he has preferred mm -hmm. as his messengers. So in this, in this form of prophecies, having knowledge of the unseen, being able to predict the future based on knowledge that's given to them by God Almighty. And if you look at whether the promised Messiah, who, the person we claim, who claimed to be the promised Messiah, who was the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, did he fulfill these? So if you look at his lifetime, we see that there are, in fact, there were thousands of incidents that um, he has narrated through his revelations, through his writings, through his prophecies that have all come to be true. Mm -hmm. So we just look at, for example, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, said that when the Messiah comes, he'll be married and you have a special marriage and a special son will be born from his marriage. And when the Promised Messiah, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadiyan salam, peace be upon him, he, during his lifetime, God Almighty promised him, according to his claim, God Almighty promised him to have a son, a very special son who will have some attributes. And in the revelation he received, God Almighty told him that he will have 52 attributes. And all of these were written by him. And um, over a few years, a son was born to him. From the name of that son to the time he would be born, and 52 different attributes were all predicted, or were all prophesied by Mr. Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian alayhi salam. And all these were, were fulfilled in Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad, anhu, who became the second caliph of um, the Ahmadi Muslim community. So there's one thing about predicting to have a child. Mm -hmm. And then further than that, knowing that one will have a, a son, mm -hmm. and then and knowing the, the odds, enmity, uh, the odds are, and not only that, all those 52 attributes, you know, he had, at that time, he had a lot of enemies around in India. So any harm could have been caused to any of his sons that were born. Mm -hmm. But then God promised him that despite all the enmity that you have around you, this child will grow up and um, he'll be a child of very good stature. He'll be extremely intelligent. You know, he'll be someone who will help Muslims, Christians, who would travel wide into the world to extend your message. And only at the very young age of 25, he became a Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. He led the worldwide, was the supreme leader of the worldwide Ahmadiyya Muslim community. At the age of 25? At the age of 25. And it was at the age of 19 that his father, the Prophet Messiah, passed away. And he stood by his bed and said, even if the whole world was to reject you, I promise that I will extend the message that you've been sent with to the all to the all the corners of the earth at just the age of 19. So this is one prophecy, in a nutshell, that tells you the truthfulness or you know how true 
those claims that he had, the conviction that he had in his claims, even before this child was born, all throughout his life, you know, were, were very truthful. Mm -hmm. And there were many other signs. So what, for what example, are some of these signs? For example, if you look at a prophecy that has been said by the Holy Prophet in, in, in Hadith, in one of his traditions, he said, when the promised Messiah comes, the, there will be a solar and a lunar eclipse in the same month, and the month would be a month of Ramadan, right? Which the is very sun, rare to have yeah, moon. to have two eclipses in a month of Ramadan, and out of the three days that the sun can eclipse, there will be a ch he chose one of those three possible days, and out of the days that the moon can eclipse as well, he chose one of those um, possible so days. So he was quite specific. He was quite specific, and the hadith was that for the eclipse of the moon. We all know that the moon can eclipse on the 13th, 14th, and 15th of a month. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, said that the first of those three possible days, so the 13th of that month of Ramadan, mm -hmm. the moon will eclipse. And the sun will eclipse in the middle of the three possible days. So from the 27th, 28th, and 29th, he said the sun will eclipse on the 28th. And in 1894, after the claim of Mirza Ghulam Muhammad of Gadian, as this promised Messiah was prophesied by the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, these eclipses occurred. Mm -hmm. And again in 1895, just the following year, so you mean it was two fulfilled again. Years. Two consecutive years, these signs were fulfilled. By two immiscible proofs. God exactly. Is not a liar. And, and this is the way, this is something that no human being can influence at all, mm. right? It's something that obviously had to do with God. It was left in the hands of God to prove him right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And these are recorded in history that they happened in 1894 and 1895, right after his claim. Wonderful. So uh, there, there are enormous signs, according to what you've said, and um, that substantiate the fact that uh, Hazrat Mizar Ghulam Ahmed is truly the promised Messiah. The next question uh, is from an unknown person, and uh, this unknown person would like to know, Ustaz Dibasab, that can you, which means can one disown their child because he or she has abandoned Islam? Can one do that? Islam is a very beautiful religion. It's a, we keep on emphasizing that it's not for any one single age or one group of people. It's for, for to the end of times. Right? It's authentic to the end of times. And it has nothing to hide. Everything about Islam is clear. Mm -hmm its teachings, its messenger, everything about it is just clear, right? And the Holy Prophet ﷺ lived by that example. And he's always encouraged by God Almighty that whenever you're preaching the message of Islam, even to the non-believers, you have to do it with wisdom, with love, and mutual understanding through dialogue, not by force. And Islam was never spread by force like is taught by um, other people who have different points of view. And um, a responsibility has been given to everyone. And the saying of the Holy Prophet is that Kullukum Rain or Kullum Mas'ulun and Rayyati. That all of you have a responsibility to fulfill. And God Almighty would ask all of you regarding the things that you know you were in charge of, per se, from the families that we had, from our workplaces, maybe you are the boss of a few people, mm -hmm. right? to whatever you know, um, role we may have in society. Everyone has a responsibility, and it's up to you to fulfill that. So as parents, your children are your responsibility. From the beginning, it's up to uh, the parents have that duty of raising them up from the food they eat, from the schools they go to, and definitely the faith they follow. Mm -hmm. right? So as a Muslim, everyone has to take that responsibility first. Of showing them the right path yep. through love and through their own example Absolutely. but if unfortunately a child or even an elder right goes away from that path mm -hmm. so how would that be dealt with so we have to remember that that responsibility if it's not fulfilled and due to the laziness or the irresponsibility of the parents mm -hmm. that child unfortunately goes away the best way would be to obviously try and get that child back mm -hmm. in the same way that even the Holy Prophet tried to get those disbelievers in the first place by explaining to them logically and showing them signs, signs that are all around us that prove the truthfulness of Islam. So and using parents, love to get them back. And as parents, especially by our practices, 
mm. the children should you know be attracted back into into Islam but one thing is that it should never be by force mm. because mm. the Holy Quran says like Raha Fiddin min al there should not be any compulsion in matters of faith mm -hmm. because right has become distinct from wrong. Mm -hmm. So you cannot force anyone to believe. Mm -hmm. Because even, you know, it says that souls can bend heads mm -hmm. but not, um, what's the thing? But not minds, yeah. right? So even if you use force, religion is something that has to do with their communion with God, God Almighty. You cannot force that into heart or into the soul of a human being, mm -hmm. right? So there, there are two different paths. So the best way would be to encourage them through dialogue and through practice to get them back instead of abandoning them. So that is love for all then, hatred for none. Because yeah. even if such an unfortunate uh, incident happens in a family, out of love for all, uh, one could get them back to their fold as parents, according to what you're saying. That, that, that's, that's quite... Um, promising and that's quite exciting to hear. But since we're talking about responsibility again, sorry for cutting you, since we're talking about responsibility, if you look at the example of Hazrat Noah with, between him and his child, when after seeing all those signs, because that's another thing, after seeing all those signs, this, the child knew that his father was a prophet of God. There were other believers that were, you know, that followed his father and he saw all those signs. If after all these, the, the person still chooses to go away, That's then it nowhere. does not become the responsibility of the parent yeah. per se to, no blame would be on them, right? So if they take their own decision and go away. No force can bring them back, mm -hmm. but they, will, they can also be brought back. Like as Noah tried to get his son back by even crying to God, but then God told him that if he has chosen to go away, mm -hmm. then he's not part of you. Mm -hmm. No, he's an impure, he's an impurity and he's not related to you, mm -hmm. even though physically he may be. That, that is amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Ustaz Abdullah Diba, for such an exquisite explanation. Uh, we do have Amanfo. Uh, Amanfo never gave his location, but he wants to know what is jihad war? What is jihad war? I think what, what he, he means is, what is jihad? Is jihad all about war, fighting in the course of Allah? What is jihad? When, when the word jihad is used, especially nowadays, by critics of Islam mostly, it's always related to bloodshed and war. Mm. But ironically, from the basics of Islam, if you look at what the word jihad just means a struggle. Mm. Someone who struggles or the act of struggling mm -hmm. for a certain cause, uh, for a certain cause mm -hmm. right? So since God, uh, religion is all about striving to build that relationship between man and God, mm -hmm. having that personal relationship with God and building it to make it better and better, mm -hmm. that strive to get to God mm -hmm. is what true jihad is. Because there may be, it may be against all odds. If you just follow our instincts, mm -hmm. there are many things that uh, man would desire to do, mm -hmm. right? But um, for example, just instead of getting up, let's say early in the morning, especially when, like in, in Africa, when you have to get up very early in the morning, some people may not have access to hot or warm water. Mm -hmm. Like in other parts of the world, you know, first you have to break your sleep and then going to that cold water, perform ablution, and then standing up there to pray to God. Someone could just choose to sleep. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, your, your, your heart would desire to just sleep and not get up. But that strife, that struggle to go against what your desire is, and standing up there in front of God to pray to Him, right? This kind of struggle is what the basics of jihad is, so to go against like your wishes the, and the, your the, desires. The, 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 the soul is willing, but the body is weak, yeah, kind exactly. of, yeah. Exactly, so torturing that, that desire that's inside you. Mm. So it starts, jihad starts with your own self, jihad bin nafs. And according to the Holy Prophet, this is the biggest jihad, this is the biggest struggle, mm -hmm. because there's ones that they were returning from a, um, a battle and uh, they're going to Medina. And the Holy Prophet Sallallahu told his companions, okay, now get ready to a bigger jihad. We are coming from a lesser jihad to a bigger jihad. In fact, from a war. From a war. He said it was a lesser one. Home, to going home. Said, we're going to a bigger jihad, hmm. which is now, this is when you will feel relaxed about everything. Hmm. And this is when it would seem as if everything is all right. Hmm. And you know, in that relaxed mode, that's when desires start flocking in. Hmm. And he said, that's when you have to fight against those desires within your own self. 
So, so there's the bigger meaning of jihad. From, from what you are telling us, jihad in itself really should the core is about struggling to become pure, to become holy. And not just about not just going killing. about. And then there's another form of jihad. In the name of God. And then there's another form of jihad with the promised Messiah, the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, may peace be upon him, has said that spreading the word of God Almighty through dialogue, through the pen like we're doing now, right, trying to spread the word of God peacefully to the people, is another form of lesser jihad after struggling against your own, against your own um, desires. So this is the second form of jihad, through the pen. Because in the time of the Holy Prophet وسلم, which is the third form of jihad, um, fighting in a battle, this is because, this is how Islam was being attacked mm -hmm. in those days. Physically, Islam was being attacked and the Muslims had to defend themselves. So to, to defend in the name of God Almighty, that was also called jihad. Nowadays, when Islam is being attacked through people writing against Islam, through videos that are may, being made against the personality, the innocent personality of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it's the responsibility of Muslims to counter-attack in the same way that Islam is being attacked, mm -hmm. through programs on TVs and radios and writing articles to portray the beautiful teachings of Islam. So when somebody, um, God forbid, uh, blasphemes and says something negative, it is not right to uh, take a cutlass or a gun or something to 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 harm that person. It, it, that the right thing is to also dialogue with the person in peaceful atmosphere. Yes, exactly. Is that what you're saying? Exactly, jihad? because that's what exactly what the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did when the chief of the um, of the hypocrites of the Labin Ubay bin Salud, mm. that was ones that. Um, he, when he was returning to Medina with some Muslims, this man was a hypocrite that was known all over the Muslims, that he was a hypocrite. And he said that when we return to Mecca, I am the most honored man in Mecca, and I will drive out the most humiliated man in Mecca. And he meant, uh, may God forbid, the Holy Prophet. So when the companions heard this, and they were very unhappy about it, so when they returned to Medina, they, they told the Holy Prophet about this. And he said, this man calls himself a Muslim and he's saying such ridiculous things. And everyone knew he was a hypocrite. He, had, he wasn't a Muslim by practice. He had left the faith. And even his own son, Abdullah, was saying, said to the Holy Prophet, if this man needs to be killed, I want to be the one to kill him. His own son. And the Holy Prophet said, no. There's no punishment for this. Just leave his matter in the hands of God. Mm -hmm. So this is the beautiful teachings of Islam. And the next question is from Esther. Esther would like to know, I am a Christian and got married to a Muslim. That's wonderful, Christian marrying Muslim. Uh, who practices juju, oh my God. Juju is the black magic, you know, African magic, the electronic, spiritual electronic things that is being done. Is it right to be with him? She's a Christian, married to a Muslim. And this Muslim guy, instead of uh, doing the right things, is doing juju, and, and the lady is concerned. She wants to know, is it right to still marry this guy or she should just leave him? I wouldn't be here advising about who should stay in a marriage or not, but um, because she probably has a personal thing against the practice of the man. So that's what we would discuss about what the teachings of Islam are with regards to um, the black magic or the juju that yeah. she's, she's talking about. And um, obviously, as far as the teachings of Islam are concerned, when it comes to you know, when it comes to the unity of God Almighty, that's something that he does not compromise with, okay? God is one and there's nothing like unto him. There's power-related stories that we, you know, we're fond of discussing in Africa and in some Indo-Pakistan, very commonly, even among Arabs as well. It is something that God Almighty discourages. When it comes to his personality, he's unique in his attributes, right, and God in, be, in his being. He's one in his being and there's no one like unto him as long as his attributes are concerned as well. So just let's take the scenario like this. If someone was to wear a juju, mm. right, which um, he believes or she believes that if someone stabs you, it won't get through. Mm -hmm. It's a very common one that people tend to believe that it works. So if let's say the person is wearing that juju and someone stabs him or her and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The first thing that will definitely go through that person's mind mm -hmm. 
and the people around there is that, okay, what happened? And his or her answer would surely be that it's because of the juju I'm wearing. So this is where the attributes of God are compromised. God Almighty Tomorrow is the one who will protect you. Or diverted. Exactly. From God, mm -hmm. attention is taken to that, whatever the person is wearing. So this is the whole reason why it's not allowed in Islam. Because the effect that it will have on the person, the day he's not wearing that, he will feel as if he's not protected. So instead of putting all his hopes in God Almighty, or let's say he ties that juju under his pillow and he gets money, if that juju is stolen, he'll be very worried. Instead of saying that God is the provider, Razik, God Almighty himself says, but he is the provider. So if someone says someone else is or something else is providing, the, the unity of God is being compromised. Yes, this, this, this lady, Esther, seems so worried. Yes, he, she doesn't mind being a Christian married to a Muslim. And she seems so worried that the husband, instead of practicing Islam, is mixing it with juju. Uh, are we saying juju works and that it doesn't, it's not Islamic but it works or is it totally uh, something that uh, Islam upholds? Well, I think this can be related to um, a story that has been narrated in, um, in the Holy Quran. It's a very quite famous story, which is why I would, I would narrate it. It's the, it's the story of Moses, Prophet Moses. Prophet Moses comes in front of Pharaoh and uh, the magicians. Pharaoh calls the best magicians in the area, and he tells them to cast their magic. Yeah, juju. And they do their juju, we can call it. And when they cast their magic, it appeared as if, you know, there were snakes. Mm -hmm. And um, Prophet Moses got a bit worried because he could see. With his naked eyes. With his naked eyes. But God Almighty told him, do not worry. Everything is, is in control. There's something beyond what your eyes can see, right? And he told him to cast his, 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 um, his, rod. his rod. And that rod changed into even, a, it appeared to be even a bigger magic, right? A bigger serpent. And it, you know, devoured all the other ones. So God Almighty says in the end of the verse that, you know, the truth prevailed and everything else was false. And obviously God Almighty took up the veil from, you know, the eyes of the people. And Prophet Moses was able to tell the people that whatever these people were doing was fake. So it was something that your eyes could see. So it's a skill that people develop, mm -hmm. right? But it's everything behind it is satanic. Mm -hmm. So the truth will always prevail over it. Mm -hmm. But for the person, it may appear as if, or even to the people, it's just a skill that is developed to, through different stages. So wonderful viewers, Muslims are not supposed to do jujus. You're supposed to worship uh, the one God, Allah, according to the Holy Quran and according to the explanations uh, that uh, our wonderful uh, missionary from the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in the UK uh, has given us. Uh, that is quite insightful. Thank you so much, sir. The next question is from Yusuf. Yusuf is asking, I am a Muslim with a Christian family. How do I convince them about Islam? I mean, I think what he wants to know is how does he convince them to join him in Islam? Um, the best example is that of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. He grew up in a society where people did not believe in God at all, okay? And um, he obviously always believed in one God. So he would go out away from the people into the cave and he would worship God. Right. So one, and then obviously when God told him to um, extend this message to the people, he started preaching to them. So I'm pretty sure the questionnaire must have started some sort of explanation, you know, to the people. So that's obviously a very good step, okay, like the Holy Prophet Sallallahu did and Muslims are encouraged to do. But it gets to a point where the people around you need to see the reason why you call yourself a Muslim. You need to be an ambassador of Islam. And people need to look at you and say, whatever this person is following is something that's good for anyone in the society. So there need to be practical examples. That the Holy Prophet Wasallam, even though people hated what he was trying to preach in the initial stages, but even the disbelievers themselves would say, 
that you know, the most, uh, the biggest of his um, enemies will say that you can say anything about him, but one thing is that he never lies. He is a trustworthy person. They used to call him Al Amin Al Sadiq, even from his young ages. He's the one that would never lie, and he's very trustworthy. Another example is that uh, when Amr bin Al As, who was sent um, as, a, as a representative of the Meccans, when uh, the Muslims were when the Muslims went to Abyssinia, mm -hmm. now which is now Ethiopia, when the Holy Prophet sent the Muslims after when persecution got to a certain point, he sent them to our motherland Africa for for safety. Mm -hmm. So this is the first place that Muslims were sent, you know. And then um, when uh, Amr bin Al As went there and he met the king Najashi, and he tried to persuade him to throw the Muslims out who you know were seeking um, asylum at that time, and one of the questions that um, he asked Amr bin al -As about this new claimant. Who is this new man? You know, he was telling him his name is Muhammad. But then one of the things he even testified at that point is that this is, one, this is someone who would never lie. Because when he told Najashi the king that he claimed to be a prophet, right, and he asked him about, you know, about his background and his, and his characteristics, and whatever he said about his personality was something that was positive. So that tells you that as a person, wherever you are, especially as a Muslim, the best example is not just what you say by word of mouth, is, but it's by practice. And the people, the family in this case about the questionnaire, the very important thing is about how you act with them and always show um, examples from the lifetime, lifestyle of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. So what you are Please trying to say is that um, Yusuf should rather depict Islam. He should live an Islamic life, a peaceful life, and a godly life, and that could, in a way, convince his family? Yeah, that would be, um, um, apart from, obviously, preaching to them mm -hmm. by telling them what it is, the best way also, along, alongside telling them, would be his own practice. Mm. That's, 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 well, that's wonderful. Ap apart from that, uh, do you think he should still live, mingle with them? or he should separate himself? What's your view? What's the Islamic view on that? If one has a family uh, that is not a Muslim family, whether Christian family, Jewish family, or atheist family, uh, if one has accepted Islam, does he separate himself from the family? Or he can still be with them and still practice his Islam? Again, we, we, know, we, we go and look at the life of the Holy Prophet, so I always tend to quote from his life because the Holy Quran tells us that the best example for you as Muslims is in the lifestyle of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. So initially before his people accepted Islam, he was living in Mecca with his companions and he was being persecuted. Mm -hmm. But he still lived with them, but it was when persecution intensified that was when God Almighty told him to move away and go to Medina. So as long as there was no persecution. He lived with them and he tried to you know, um, um, preach to them so that they would become Muslim. So in that same sense, as far as he's not being persecuted, he, he should live with them and try to you know, tell them about the beauties of Islam. So Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings of God be upon him, did that. Prophet Jesus also did that. He said, I came uh, for uh, the sinners, not for the uh, so-called upright people. So. Uh, what we are hearing today is that our lifestyles should be the words, the preaching words. We should live what we believe, and uh, that may uh, get people on our side. And we should be loving everyone, love for all, hatred for none. That's all time will permit us on your questions. Please keep sending in your questions, and we'll do our best uh, to answer your questions. This is your host, Ibrahim K. Asante. Assalamu alaikum and peace be upon you until we meet in our next episode.